Hey everybody, and welcome back to more CCLP3. I've got my grape juice once again, although I guess it's not grape juice this time, it's more mixed berry juice, but it's juice, and it's awesome. So, today we're on how to get around in Venice, and there's a couple interesting things to note about this level. The first one is that um, it was the second highest voted level in CCLP3 voting, which is pretty awesome, and much like it's... Uh, counterpart that got the highest votes, it was designed by Joshua Bone. Now some of you who are really astute observers may have uh, remembered that there was a level in CC2 named Venice, and it was also designed by Joshua Bone, and it was uh, the level that ultimately inspired this in a lot of ways, which is pretty awesome. So yeah, there's this puzzle involving glider cloning here, pretty neat. I don't know if I'm going to be very talkative today because I'm actually feeling rather sick, so... Yeah. Hoping I'll get better here soon. It's no fun being sick over a weekend. It really isn't. But hey, Chip's Challenge is always the best medicine, right? So I'm going to use this last block over here to bridge. You can actually use the one in the room that we bridged to down there, but there isn't really a strict requirement to use both, so that's kind of nice. And thankfully, this is the last, uh, well, actually, it's not really the last block-pushing puzzle we've got, but it is the last one we have before we get flippers, so that's something. I really like this construction right here. Uh, there is uh, some fire under those blocks, but you don't have any really, you don't really have any real reason to push those because there's fire bordering them. And that's a little evil hiding the trap or the blue button under that block, but it's not too bad if you're just experimenting with everything. And I don't think pushing the other blocks in really affects anything. But yeah, after this, it's pretty much just a straight item swapper. There really isn't a whole lot else that uh, makes level too difficult. And. We just need to take care of this last block, push it on the trap button, and we'll get ourselves some fire boots. And we already know where we can use the fire boots. That's another thing that makes this rather simple, is that all the other locations, I think they all pretty much just require, uh, or all the other items just require one use somewhere. Okay, so there we are. We got this over here. And I think the toggle is down by that ice area we passed by. Yes, it is. So we'll have to get skates later. There should be a yellow door right up here, right? Yeah, here we go. Alright, that wasn't so bad. There's a suction-y area over this way along with some fire that we can go through. So I was wrong, you can use the fire boots in two places. So my bad on that. And so we need to use a red key and blue key right here and get the green key. All right, so in order to get those skates, I need to block one tank off before I switch the button. And from here, it's just a matter of getting the skates and then the last chip and then exiting. All three of which can be done in the same general area, which is nice. So here's something that's rather ironic. The other, uh, the original Venice level from CCLP or CC2, is quite a bit larger than this, and is technically harder. But it actually takes much less time. Well, not much less time, but it takes less time to solve than um, this one does if you, you're going for the bold route. Anyway, this next level, Fireball Tourism, this has a story portion. I was getting a little bit ahead of myself there. So let's read that. Chip City was now just a train ride away from the seaside town that Chip had reached. Unfortunately, he had run out of money along the course of his journey thus far and couldn't afford the train ticket. But luckily for him, the travel agency offered him a part-time job as a tour guide. Guided tourism can be fun for fireballs. Guide them around the area and make sure all of them make it to the dock. I remember we actually had to reward, like, reward that hint a bunch, because I think the original iteration of it had some grammar issues, and then I came up with this really wordy version that was just really 
badly written, and so I think Mod Hop eventually came up with that version. But there's another little interesting factoid about this level that a lot of people don't know. But if you were to play the original versions of each of these levels, you'd figure this out. So let me do this this way so I don't block the trip to the exit. So this level was designed by Rolf Redford, um, who, as I've mentioned in the past, designed quite a few levels in CCLP2. And he actually um, originally built this level with a Fireball clone machine instead of that little room that we saw at the beginning. And in addition to that, he uh, had walls around pretty much the entire level except this dock area. There was water here, I think, at the very end. So we decided that it would be way too easy to bust the level with you know crazy collisions and stuff if we went that route. So what we decided to do instead was just make this level kind of a seaside town, as the uh, story said, uh, just to kind of make it fit more with the tourism thing, and then also give it a, a little bit more designed, uh, a little bit more of a design boost, I guess you could say. Also, the bold route for this level is really fun. Like, if you figure it out, it's like one of those things that you just love to watch over and over again. Anyway, the next level is Take the I Train. This is another one of Tom Rao's levels, and a pretty fun one to optimize. It's not really that hard to optimize. And that's saying quite a bit, just because his levels are generally really difficult to optimize. So if there's any optimizers out there who are really looking for a challenge while we wait for CCLP4, check out Tom Rao's set. It is, it is a crazy level set to optimize. So the whole general concept of this level is that you just zip around each of the areas through this force floor thing, which is pretty cool. And then you exit there on the left. And along the way, you have obstacles and monsters to dodge and stuff. And I really like this level as a monster dodging level. Like, I feel like this sort of level is a good instructive tool for predictable monster dodging, as some might call it. And I'm not sure if we can get to... Yeah, we can get to these. I should have gotten these earlier. But seriously, there aren't really enough levels like this. I think one of the only other ones I can think of that really works well as both a dodging level and a puzzle level is Jeffrey's uh, Twisty Little Passages. Like, that level is a really good example of how to build something like that. And for the record, I'm really hoping it makes it into CCL before. I mean, we don't really have a whole lot of just maze levels with things other than the maze in them. Okay, I'm going to actually try to ride this back here. Because I want I don't want to miss anything, and I really, really don't want to take another trip around. Yeah, I have a lot of memories of Tom Rowell's level set. I think one of the things that it really inspired me to do was to not release my whole set at once, just add levels to it a little bit at a time. Nowadays, level sets tend to be a little bit different when it comes to that sort of thing. Most of the time, people actually take the time to build out their whole set, or they do add a little bit to it at a time and then eventually reorder everything in the set so that it actually has a proper difficulty curve and stuff. Which, I really appreciate that, because the whole idea of just adding random levels with no difficulty curve, particularly in the realm of let's playing and, you know, just playing something once it's a complete product in general, it's not really the best thing to do. That would have been a good spot for a chip. At least I don't think there was a chip there, was there? I'm going to assume not. And I think all of this is, yeah, that's just walls. All right, two chips left. We're almost done. And they're both right here. And we can just hop right back onto the Force Force slide. So that should be Take the I Train complete. And whoops, I guess we'll have to take a slightly longer trip. But there we go. Not bad at all. All right, so the next level is titled Niche. This level was made by Daniel uh, Bowmeister. And I mentioned him back during the... Uh, CCLP2 playthrough. I really like his level design. I really do. 
Like it's really neat and fun and as I mentioned back then, he has a knack for building out rooms that aren't really perfectly shaped, so to speak. And I love that. Like that's one of my like favorite design tactics. But it's one that I'm not very good at. Like it's one that I really need to work on because I do tend to generally make very matrixed, neat looking levels. Whereas a level like this, it just feels really organic and just I don't know, it just why did I do that? That was silly. It just somehow feels right, for lack of a better way of putting it. And that time they collided differently. Okay. Okay, there, whoa. That was a very interesting collision. And I'm gonna have to go here first. And, oh, I forgot to go there, duh, okay. Well, you live and learn, even though you did it right earlier. It's funny, like, there's a certain element of muscle memory that still exists, even after you haven't played a level in a while. And it happens for me on certain levels. I'd say this is one of them, just because I played this level a lot before CCLV3 was released. I really liked this level back when it was released in Daniel B1, I think, was where it was originally found. Okay, I'm just going to let all the f bugs go down there. So we need to bridge that way. And I just realized I need to clear this dirt. So all the bugs should die. Yeah, they're, they're all dying down there. In the water. But the general idea of this level, like moving the blocks uh, off and on the trap buttons and stuff. I really like that. In fact, I liked it so much I decided to use it in one of my own levels and expand it a little bit further. The level appears a, la a little later in CCLP3 and it's called Water Trap. Uh, kind of like Fire Trap, except not really. But it features the same mechanic times like six or so. And it's a pretty tough level. The funny thing about that level though, and I know I'm not even on it yet and I'm already talking about it, but the funny thing about it was that I actually designed another level called Water Trap a long time ago, and it was actually more akin to another Daniel Bowmeister level that appears later on in the set, which is named Mistakes. Uh, but I decided to just ditch that because it was way too much of a ripoff, and it just didn't really have enough original stuff in it. And also, the clone button connections and all that good stuff weren't pedantic, so yeah. Anyway, that's that level done, and we are now on Ship Alone, Lost in Ship City. So this level has a funny story behind it. Those fireballs are on your back. Now that you're in the city, go into the deserted house and guide them to the bombs. So this level, this level is kind of funny because it has a rather awkward history. It was designed by Tom Patton, and the funny thing about it is that it's a sequel to another level he made called Chip Alone. Problem is that Chip Alone um, didn't make it into a CCLP by the time this set happened. Oh, whoa, I didn't mean for that to... Okay, whoops. There we go. You can go, go in there. I think... Is that going to be open? No, okay. Whew, <laughs> that was... That was really scary. Um, so anyway, what we decided to do is, even though this level title is very clearly a reference to Home Alone, we thought that having a 2 in front of it, which the original level did, would be confusing. So instead, we decided to just say, Chip Alone Lost in Ship City without a 2 in front of it, just to avoid the confusion. So I'm just going to clear the way for this fireball over... Where is he? He's over here. Um, so I'm going to need to push that up, and then he's going to come through here. So then he's going to get stuck in there. And then I can release him. He's going to go all the way into that area by that teleport. Oh, wait, I can't go through there. I can, however, go through this. Except I need to actually go to the other side where there's... Not a force floor blocking the way, so let me do that. I should have just stuck with this path. 
Okay, so once he goes through there, where is he going to end up once he goes through there? I'm a little worried about where he's going to end up. I'm trying to remember where he goes after that. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Is there an, a teleport around here I'm just forgetting about? Oh, he goes through that. Okay, cool. Okay, that's good news. Um... Oh, whoa! Oops, that's not good news. Okay. See, I thought he was going to go into that trap that's, like, right here, and then I would have to press the button, but apparently not. Okay, never mind. That was a very dumb way to do that. Let me get the mouse out of the way here. Okay. Uh, I'm going to hold these down. I believe these... Uh, hold down traps toward the end of the level, if I'm not mistaken. It's a little confusing what traps are connected to what. That is one thing I don't like about this level. Other than that, it's a very well-designed level. Like, there's some that are near each other, like that right there, and so that's obvious, thankfully, but some others, not so much. Okay, I remember where the the other teleport is. It's in an area that we can't even see. Which is a little unfair, I think. It's like toward the bottom, I'll show you when we exit, because we're going to actually go through it at the end. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and just release this guy. Okay, so he's going to go through there. Then I can release him. Okay, I just have to make sure I plot the path I'm going to take here. So the nice thing is that the force floor slide in that left area does keep the fireball there. So no matter what happens, we do have that guarantee, so to speak. So let me go through that. Okay, he's gonna come around here. Okay, so now he's gonna get stuck there, so that's nice. So now I need to press the toggle button to let him through. I'm not even sure what that trap's connected to. Um, where is the, oh wait, the toggle button's down here. I'm really forgetting this level. Like, this is an example of a level that I don't remember too well. Just because it's been forever since I've gotten the bold time on it. Mm. Okay, so now the fireball should go all the way over here. And, uh, yes, he's going to end up in the trap. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, this trap button will release the fireball that's in the top right. Because there was a trap up there. Yes, okay, so now they're both stuck. So I think these two buttons should take care of them. Alright, there we go. And now we can get both chips. And these right here, I think these are the traps that we held down with the blocks earlier. I'm not entirely certain why those are there. Hmm. That's really interesting. But, we are now free, I believe, we are free at least to go to the exit now that we have all the chips. And here's the area I was referring to. You get to go down here. So that fireball would have gone with the chips down there. He would have looped around, gotten, bounced off the fire boots, and then gone around here. Oh, he would have gone through here. That's what the trap buttons were for. Okay, never mind. So you didn't even need to hold him down with the blocks. You could have just pressed them yourself. Um, and we can actually walk around here which is pretty awesome. There's like tons of extra pointless stuff here, which I really like that. It kind of adds to the aesthetic. This kind of thing really reminds me of what I used to build as a kid. Like just lots of pointless stuff and neat things like that. Anyhow, on to Complex, which has a story uh, segment before it. Chip had finally completed a long eventful journey to Chip City and stood at the doors to the new clubhouse. Although tired, he was eager to find out what new tests awaited past the entrance. Belinda's e words echoed through his mind. The levels in this clubhouse are going to be a bigger challenge than ever! Chip gingerly opened the door to find a swarm of gliders circling around a small room. It's good to be indoors again, he shouted. Yeah, I couldn't really think of a better phrase to put there, so I just said it's good to be indoors again. Which is kind of lame, I know. 
Uh, and also, this section is kind of a little annoying. Uh, okay, I'm going to need to find a way to deal with that. I think that will do, though. Yep, they stopped. Okay, so complex. This is a very long item swapper type level with a lot of little challenges in it. And you'd think you need a partial post here, but you really need to actually just... Whoops, I didn't mean to boost it like that. You really just need to uh, push the blocks into the bomb. So a lot easier than it may seem at first. <coughs> oh, man. I'm sorry about that. Excuse me. I... I've just been sneezing like crazy the last few days. So, while we go through this level, I want to talk to you guys about something that's been on my mind lately. Uh, again. So, I don't really talk about politics too much on this channel and stuff, but I've really been fed up with this whole election nonsense. I, I really have. I mean, I feel like the whole election has just gotten everyone on edge. Everyone's just been going crazy, including me. You know, and I've been having to tell myself, you'll be okay, you don't have to get all riled up about this, you know, don't worry, etc. But it's, it's hard to remember that sometimes, and especially with a lot of hype. And that's what I fear has just gripped the hearts of everyone around, is just hype. And that's pretty much what it is. And I hope I don't need that fireball for anything. I don't think I do. So we should be okay. But I mean, seriously, you know, we have social media nowadays, and I don't want to discount the consequences of what could happen if we elect candidate A or candidate B or whatever, because, I mean, there's always going to be something, positive and negative, and, well, with the people running this time around, I'd have to say it's mostly negative. But there's a couple of things that really bother me about it. One is that, you know, because we have social media, it's way too easy to see whenever something crazy happens. And then get worked up over that. And I don't think there's anything else to do, right? We got everything we need. Yep. Okay. So we can see whenever someone says something silly or, you know, says something racist or, you know, just whatever. Just all those things. And I'm not condoning those things at all. I mean, I think those things are not good, obviously, and not very healthy. And, you know, qualities like that are not very becoming of a presidential candidate, no matter what party you're from or whatever. But the problem is that it's easy to react to those things. Um, and how in the world do I get... Is this it? Okay, this is it. It's way too easy to be reactive about those things whenever we can just hear things instantly. I mean, recently I had a friend over, and that was the night that the Paris terrorist attacks happened. I mean, awful tragedy. But I mean, we heard about it instantly. Yesterday, I mean, in the, in the realm of yesteryear, we would have had to wait until the next morning before that news reached our shores. I mean, it's awful what happened. You know, but because we got news of it right away, I mean, it became this trending thing on Facebook, and we, we all changed our pictures to, you know, pictures of the French flag, you know, superimposed on our faces and everything. And I'm not discounting that. I think that's great that people do that. I'm not trying to badmouth that at all. Because, I mean, we should be showing support uh, to people in need and all that. But I'm just saying, in the world of immediacy, you know, we can just instantly react to stuff, even when we don't have all the facts, or, you know, even when we need to wait a little bit longer to let things sink in. And it's just prompted more and more reactivity from people, I fear. That's what really concerns me. So, all that to say, I guess I'm just not really a big fan of buying into hype. For one thing, I don't believe that any one news source contains everything you need to know about everything. But we've set ourselves up to receive news from our preferred news sources that basically confirm every bias that we have. Not exactly the most healthy place to be. And it's just... It just, you know, makes everything so easy in terms of constructing this bubble for yourself in which everything pretty much confirms everything that you think. Again, it's not really a healthy place to be. I mean, you really need to view life through several lenses. Because, I promise you, the one you... Are you kidding? I didn't realize that that... Oh my goodness, that did not just happen.
that did not just happen. Well, at any rate, I can talk about this for a little while longer, I guess. That's the bright side. I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, every because everyone is going to be biased, you really need to be more well-rounded than just one place where you get to hear what you want to hear. And, I mean, that applies for just about anything in life. You know, one of the things I, I like to tell people is that you really need to listen more to other people. I mean, I'm not saying that as... It's as if to say, oh, you know, I'm above all that and all that stuff. Because I'm not. I'm really not. I mean, I struggle with this too, like everybody else. But, I mean, guys, we really need to work on listening to each other. One of my friends posted on Facebook last year in the wake of all the, all the racial tension in Ferguson and everything. You know, if you're not affected by this, you know, you're going to have a way different opinion than someone who is. But we really need to listen to people who are and aren't affected, you know, vice versa. You know, people who may not exactly have the same experience we do when it comes to this. And because I'm sure they'll appreciate someone just listening to them, you know, not trying to spout off a bunch of pre-prepared talking points just to say, oh, I'm right and I want to perpetuate my narrative as much as I want, so I'm going to blast all this in your face. I mean, no, that's not what people need these days. People need a listener. So his analogy was, you know, in the world of biology, you know, and I, I don't mean to say this for the shock value or anything, but just to paint a picture, the practice of incest is very highly looked down upon just because it increases the uh, possibility of genetic mutations and abnormalities in offspring. And it's basically the same thing in the world of ideas. I mean, if you spend all your time around people who think exactly like you do, you know, the whole birds of a feather flock together mentality, then whether you like it or not, there's somehow, some way, at some point, going to be some mutations and abnormalities in your thinking. And most likely, you will never really realize that there are just because you don't have any real accountability in your life. I mean, not really. I mean, if everyone thinks like you do, and they're all going to, you know, adopt, you know, those subtle changes that often occur, you know, in our viewpoints, they'll never really quite notice that. And so, you know, there's all kinds of things that are going to creep in there no matter what. And we see it, you know, all the time. You know, people just shout things at each other these days just because, you know, it's the talking point that they're used to hearing or that they want to grab onto and everything. But, you know, putting your convictions through the fire, it's worth it. It's not easy, but it's worth it. Because ultimately, you know, if something is true, it's going to be true no matter what someone says. I mean, really, it's going to be true no matter what someone says. And if it's not true, then you really should be getting rid of that. And again, that may be hard if it's something that you've clutched onto for a while. And if, it's, if that is the case, and it's especially hard because you have to let go of your pride and, you know, you really have to work through some things. But I'm telling you, it's worth it in the end to put your convictions through the fire, to refine them. So anyway, that's, that's one thing. The other thing that I've also, that's also been on my mind is... I'm really sick and tired of there being only two options that people talk about in the political arena. I mean, since when were there only two options? There are more than two options, guys. I mean, if you don't like Trump or Hillary, and I'm, I personally don't. I'm just going to just lay my cards on the table right now and just say that. I don't have any shame in saying that. But if you don't like the two of them, vote for someone else. You know, there are other parties out there. There are other choices out there. You're not bound to two parties. Oh, but third party candidates can't get ahead. Well, no, they're not going to get ahead unless you vote for them. I mean, really. I mean, I had a kid um, a few months ago in my church. I was helping him out with a thing, and he was like, oh, I can't do it. It's too hard. and I'll never get past this thing. I'll never do this. And I'm like, well, no, you're not going to be able to do it if you keep telling yourself that. I mean, that goes for anything in life. So, no. You can't just say that a third party candidate's never going to win and then just resign yourself, you know, to this to the chains of a two party system that's, you know, the way it's going right now, it's pretty flawed. I think a lot of us can kind of admit that with the people we've got running in the you know, as the presumptive nominees. Um, but seriously, people, I mean, 
if you want to vote for someone else, don't let anyone stop you from doing that. Vote your conscience. Walk away from the ballot with a clean conscience. What a novel concept. You know, just go to the ballot and vote for someone because, you know, if enough people do that, those major parties are actually going to take notice because they're going to lose their market share, so to speak. They're going to lose that voting segment that they had been counting on. I mean, it happened at least once in our nation's history. It can happen again. I mean, just saying. It can happen a second time. So don't go around saying that it will never happen because it has happened and it can happen again. If you really want to bring about lasting change, you know, try doing something like that because really if, if you just stick with the system and you're, you're like, oh, I'll vote for so-and-so because they're not the other candidate, well, nothing's really going to change because voting is just a binary choice. I mean, there's really nothing about it that's going to tell you know, the people as, that are part of the political parties that something needs to change because you can't attach a list of grievances to your vote. You can't do anything like that. Uh, you can't complain. So, I mean, come on, people. Really, now. I, I'm sorry. I, I know I'm getting on my soapbox here, but I'm just sick and tired of just being told, no, you can't do anything by voting for a third-party candidate. Because maybe I'm just all about the underdogs, but seriously, to anyone who is running, and I hate using the term third party because, again, it's another one of those things that kind of perpetuates this notion that there are only th two choices and that there's just oh, this extra choice out there that no one's ever going to vote for. It doesn't have to be that way, guys, and I don't know why I stepped there. Anyway, uh, enough soapboxing. I'm going to just stop now. Um. So this, the last level was designed by Peter Marks, who I alluded to earlier was a part of the staff. This room here, I'm going to show you, you can't get out of this room. This is a really funny room. Um, so yeah, this room is a total red herring. So this level was designed by Gavin Duncan. We haven't seen a level by him in a little while. And it actually has a funny story behind it as far as getting into the set. So the original title of this level was Pot Pie Puri. It was like potpourri, but with pie in the middle. And so we thought that was a really strange level title. But one of the things that Gavin Duncan did in his level set was that he used actual words or sets of words as his passwords Excuse me, when uh, making levels. And the password for this level was Oh Ho. So we thought, why not just make that the password? I mean, why don't we just do that? So we decided on Oho as the... Oh, wait, I just realized that was stupid. I, I, I don't have to go to that toggle or that recessed wall until the end. Ah, now I'm just getting frustrated and trying to rush this. Maybe I shouldn't have ranted about politics. That was... That may not have been the best idea. But anyway, those are just some of my thoughts. I I hope that doesn't offend anybody. I mean, if you decide who you're going to vote for, you know, vote your conscience. That's fine. But, you know, please don't vote for someone just because they're not another candidate. I mean, that's, that's really silly. I mean, I, I just feel like in our age of immediacy, it's just all too easy to focus on one immediate election. Really, life is not about one point in time. I mean, it's it's a film strip, not a snapshot. So I, I don't buy into that crap. I mean, seriously, it's not just about one election. If you're if that's all you're thinking about when you're voting, you you probably shouldn't even be voting. I mean, I'm just gonna be really honest there. Anyway, okay, now I'm done. Now, now I'm done. So yeah, this part here involves just leading these gliders here. And it's kind of misleading because I honestly thought that glider that went to the ball area was going to just totally get me there. But thankfully he didn't. So that's Oho done. And now on to Slideshow. This level is cool. It was designed by Peter Marks once again. And it originally had the title Block Puzzle. Well, it turned out that the words block and puzzle were literally the most overused words and titles for CCLP3 levels, so we thought, you know, we ought to just give this level a different name. And one of the names was Slide Sorter, I think. There were a few others as well. But we eventually landed on Slideshow, which I really like. I think Slideshow is a great name. 
So I'm just gonna go up that way, I think. Oh no, that goes, wait, how do you? Okay, there we go, that's the way. And it pretty much culminates in this little area here at the end where you have to clone some blocks and stuff. And this is actually kind of a little tricky. The bold route actually involves catching blocks as they're going off the slide and through the ice and everything. I don't think I'm going to try doing that here. I'm just going to play it safe. You can, however, do this, which is kind of nice. And you can just push them around like that. So I'm just going to do that one at a time just to be on the safe side. Yeah, I don't remember the exact number of moves you have to wait there, so I'm not going to worry about it too much. And there. So yeah, this is pretty much just repetition. The bold route is way more interesting, thankfully. This, is, this level definitely falls in that category of you feel like there should be more possible when you optimize this, but there really isn't. Alright, so here we need a block for the end as well, so I'm just going to go ahead and grab one and bring it with us. This is a little mean because I do believe that there is a force force slide so you wouldn't be able to come back to figure out that you need a block. I think there's a force force slide, let's see. Yep. Maybe you can go back, let me see. Oh yeah, you can go back. Okay, that's that's not bad then. Okay, so I'm gonna be very careful about how I push this. Okay, here we go. We got it. Made it! So that's the end of slideshow, and now we can move on to Queer the Way. This level is another in a in a series of uh, what's the term here? Uh, let me restart that. That. That sequence was really bad. I'm gonna, okay, there, that's better. That's much better. Uh, so this level is another level in a sequence of levels that originally referenced other levels and were trying to be sequels to them, but were different enough that we had to change the title. So this level was made by Mike Lask and he originally titled this level Reversi 2, I believe. And as you might recall in CCLB2, Reversi was that level with the toggle walls that you had to switch. So, like Switch Hit 2 slash All About Buttons, we decided just to change the name to something completely different. And I thought this title would be kind of fun since you kind of had to queer a bunch of stuff for a lot of this level. So this part here is a little interesting. Oh. Yeah, I didn't mean for that to happen. Let's not do that again. All right. Uh, think I'm just gonna stick with this tank formation. I mean, I I really don't want to do anything crazy here. Although I think I can press it twice and I can get a better. Let me try that. Yeah, I think that's ultimately better. Because then I can just turn right here. This level is fun, like as a variety level. I think some of my favorite variety levels tend to be the ones where there's sort of a concept that's highlighted and the level just develops that concept um, quite a bit. And it's especially nice when like the difficulty kind of steadily increases or at least the level tries to build on what you've learned, if that makes sense. Okay, I'm just going to see how that works out. Don't tell me that... Okay, that's... I should not have done that. That was dumb. Okay, uh... Will that work? I guess that would work too. I think that's actually what's used in the bold route, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, let me clear the way there. Get it? See what I did there? So yeah, we've passed the numerical halfway point for the set. And I say numerical because, well, 
the later levels are going to be ridiculous. So we're not even halfway done with this Let's Play. Not by a long shot. Okay, the glider is definitely going to bounce back there. So let's do this. Okay, so he's going to go that way. Uh, let's see here. I got a better idea. Do that. It wasn't quite the idea I had in mind, but it'll work. All right, finally. I, I don't really like that section very much, but like I said, monster manipulation was pretty much all the rage when this set was built. And I didn't need to dip down there. I don't know why I dipped down there. All right, so... Really? You have to have the toggles in a specific state. I did not even realize that. That is really stupid. Like, seriously, what... Really? I did not know that. That's very questionable. Not a fan of that. And really, this level's not that hard. It's, it really isn't. It's just a matter of just making it through each room and stuff. All right, let's see if we can get this. All right, come back here, then we'll... I'm going to go back and change this. There we go. I know why the toggles are there, but it would have been nice if there were there was a toggle button over here. I mean, you can technically see that there's a bunch of open toggle walls, or in that case it would have been closed toggle walls here, but really, you wouldn't have known that there wasn't a button up there, for instance. Alright, so we have a little vanishing act type section. All these are invisible. And then we get to do some monster dodging, so yay! I'm going to take care of the walker because walkers are evil. And let's get that Pyramecium out of here, why don't we? There's also teeth to think about. Get you guys out of here. Get the chips. Alright, we got all the chips, so let me head back. The nice thing about this is that you can pretty much just trace your steps with the way the path is laid out here. And other than a fork at the very end, I believe there is only one way to get there anyway, so you pretty much have to go back the way you came. Alright, made it out of clear the way, and on to checkers. Oh my goodness, I love this level. This is really cool. So checkers um, is a rare example of when a pie guy bold was beaten, and this was actually pretty recent. Jeffrey Barden actually beat the bold that uh, Warwick Anderson had set, and Pie Guy had confirmed. So it's, I guess it's technically not really a Pie Guy bold, but it is one that he had. Um, and it's a pretty tricky level to optimize, but it's very rewarding. Like, when you finally get it, it's like, oh, so that's how that goes. Um, I'm just going to bridge down here. And I'm going to clear this up off here. So the exit's down over here. This is another level, uh, much like Cheap Shots and Dirty Tricks, that is what I'd call diagonally symmetrical. And it's a really fun example of that. I really like it a lot. Uh, let's see. I'm going to do this. There we go. Also, optimizing this in links is... Uh, Quite a challenge, but the route I used to get the bold on this could uh, pretty much easily be translated for that. Also, this was designed by Ida Robertson, who, as I've mentioned in the past, is one of my favorite designers for this set. She's really awesome. So that should do it for this decade. So in the next video, we will move on to possible. So I'll see you guys then. Thanks so much for watching. Hope you guys uh, didn't mind the little rant earlier, and uh, yeah, I'll see you next time. So take care, and I'll catch you on the flip side.